Welcome to the second day of our virtual symposium. So today we are celebrating the World Water Day. And for sure, this symposium become very timely as we will still and uh, having these uh, conversations on cool insights for a hot world. And please uh, remind, uh, we would like to remind you that now we are talking about the policy actions which also uh, will be uh, interesting topics for you all. And first of all, I would like to check to Nairobi. Uh, Peter, are you there? Nairobi is ready, yes. Okay, thank you, Peter. Okay, for the first speaker today, we will present Pak Maina van Rodrik, Professor Maina van Rodrik from uh, the World Agrofery Center and also the University of Wageningen and Brawijaya. And Pak Maina, he will present the wrap up of uh, yesterday's sessions and he will also provide you some more provocating thinking about how we will bring up the second day. Pak Maina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Lei. Yes, so um, uh, we understand yesterday there were some problems for people to follow the live stream, and we, we apologize for some of the technical shortcomings on that. Um, but I hope we can get back an overview of what happened yesterday for those who could not follow, and, and we hope today we'll have even more people following online and through the part. So the program we have on our cool insights for a hot world. Um, in yesterday, we discussed a number of points for that. We, we received a number of, of feedbacks within the symposium part and also separate by email. And I'd like to share a few of those. Um, I thought it went very well. I raised some interesting issue. It's very brave. Um, thanks, more tomorrow. I was online last night from Hobart in, in Tasmania and I thoroughly enjoyed the symposium. Some comments that you might want to consider for follow-up. Um, to what extent do current global models include forest effects on rainfall at the local scale already? If not, um, that seems to be a real important thing for future to, to make sure that is represented. And I applaud the efforts to explore this, but the idea that planting and managing forest for distant water outcomes seems fraught, seems to be even more complicated than the carbon story. So uh, we need further discussion on how that could happen. Then somebody else said, well, I followed the presentations. I like it. Um, I would like to ask if these presentations are available. And, and yes, um, we promise by n early next week, Monday or Tuesday, that, that all the cleaned up presentations will be online. So. Uh, we can continue the discussion then. Um, and okay, the person said, I, I've been working in a basin in Kenya, um, and uh, there's still a lot of stuff to follow up on. I'd like to work with you. I have a student. Could they be involved in what we're doing? So yeah, that is the type of response we, we were happy to see. So yesterday, within our overall cool insights for a hot world, we, we started with the first block of speakers that talked about how is this related to the Global Climate Convention and what is the big story of that full hydrological cycle and what do we know about what happens in clouds and how they are formed. And then the second block went more to the, the relations in the landscape itself and the changes in tree cover. What does it mean for evapotranspiration? Uh, what can we learn from the trees themselves, how they respond and how do we understand that balance between the rainbow, the green, and the blue water? So in the first block, um, we started with uh, Daniel Mordiarso, who explained that the current climate convention is really focused on greenhouse gases and carbon. Um, but under the adaptation chapter, it's possible to bring in the type of things we discuss here. And he shared five cool insights on forest and water that were shared in a brief last year, where we focus on the first three of them in this meeting here. Then David Allison, the, the lead author of the paper that we are discussing here, basically took us how we, we need to go from an understanding of watershed management and water balance that has rainfall as a given and has evapotranspiration as a loss, how we need to move to an understanding of the full hydrological cycle, the hydrological space and that evapotranspiration is not a loss, but a recycling. 
And that we can actually ask that question, where does rainfall come from? And that, that it has spatially explicit answers and it doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, we, we need to bring that into the story. Then Cindy, Cindy Morris, took us through an exciting tour of, of how we understand clouds and how we understand clouds of different temperatures and how the formation of ice that is the start of rainfall depends on biological agents like bacteria that many of you may have never heard before, but that are an important part of the story. So it's not about plants only, it is about plants and their microflora. Then in the questions, um, we had interesting discussions on some of the technical detail of, of what is that, ice nucleation, etc. And then we gradually moved on if we can change the rainfall, who, who has the right to do that, etc. So uh, give very brief answers here. There will be more detail on the website later on. But, but I think the discussion started from the technical and went towards this issue of can we optimize land use if it is no longer only about carbon, but all these other things, how can we do that? Then in the second block, we had, we focused quite a bit on the work in, in East Africa. Michael Marshall took us through maps of land cover change in East Africa, not just forest, non-forest, but many different degrees of tree cover, um, and showed maps of where we can see statistically significant feedbacks between vegetation and precipitation. Aster followed up with that with work on the tree rings, so how the trees themselves tell the story of historical part, and how if we take a study site somewhere in Ethiopia, how we see strong spatial correlations with aspects of climate quite far out into West Africa. So that it brings us to that point of the teleconnections. Um, in my own presentation, I focused on the <coughs> concept of the teleconnections. How is what the rainfall at some place dependent on what happens with land cover somewhere quite far. And we found three <coughs> places specifically interesting the Amazon, the African relation, and the Southeast Asia part. And we came to this point that, that we really can and should change the narrative. If we can start with issues about temperature and water, we are much closer to, to the hearts and the heads of the people on the ground. Um, and we need to explore that whole space to policies from that reality on the ground. In our discussions, we had <coughs> questions on on the technical side, on the time lags involved and how complicated these spatial analyses are, um, that trees themselves are already suffering from climate change in parts of Ethiopia, that water is a greenhouse gas functionally, but not in the way it is. we do the accounting of that, and that this point of these precipitation sheds, the spatial areas from which rain originates, can be a very powerful way of starting discussions at the policy level. At the same time, we don't know all the fine details of that. So we, we ended up with this question about, do we know it all? Do we know everything? Of course, the answer is no, and scientists like that, because that's our job to find out more about the things that we don't know about. But do we know enough to act on? And I think that is really the, the hot question for today. Um, and the final discussion will come back to that. So. Today, as a preview, we'll have in block three, we'll have um, Jan Pokorny and Douglas Scheel. Uh, Jan will focus on this question that trees really are cool in a, in a literal sense. And Douglas will take us it through the theories that forests themselves generate the flow of atmospheric moisture that causes rain. After that, we'll discuss those two, and then we'll have the final block Three speakers that, that relate what we do here to the practice of restoration, to the forest and water policy, and to the research programs that is hosting this part where we will talk about linking knowledge and action and come back to this point. Do we know enough or do we need to know more about it? So that is as a brief wrap up of what we did on the first day and hopefully feed into what we will try to achieve today. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much, Pat. Indeed, it was very insightful. And also providing us like a clear picture of what we will do for today. So let me introduce Douglas. Douglas, are you there? I hope you can hear me. Okay, very can well. <laughs> yes, very well. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Good, very good. 
Okay, welcome, yes. Douglas. And uh, the floor Thank is you. yours. Yeah. yeah. So today I'm going to talk about forests and rain, and I'm going to particularly focus on some <laughs> exciting new ideas that I think bring new opportunities. So it's not hard to justify an interest in water. Already during the 20th century, global water use, that's water used by people, has increased around six times. We are in a situation now where around two-thirds of the world's population already experience some shortage of water for more than a month every year. And we live in a world where already half a billion people, a huge number of people, face water scarcity as a daily problem. There are, of course, other concerns with water, not just water scarcity, but also the problems of droughts when we have too little rainfall and floods where we have too much. Uh, these have also caused significant hardships, uh, many millions of deaths over the last century and some billions of people needing emergency assistance. So reliability of rain, scarcity of water, major global concerns. So in this graphic, I'm just showing you a little bit about the global water cycle. The units here are in thousands of kilometers cubed per year, so these are huge volumes of water. Uh, so first, let's just look at rainfall over land is about 113,000 cubic kilometers per year, and that is the water that is falling on the land surface out of the atmosphere. So where does that water come from? Well, some of it comes from the ocean. This is water that evaporates off the sea and into the atmosphere and then is carried by the winds over land to fall as rain over land and that's about 40,000 cubic kilometers per year. But what I really wanted to highlight in this slide was that actually the largest number uh, comes from off the land surface. So that's water that's evaporated off the land surface maybe after rain or is transpired by vegetation out of the soil and into the atmosphere. So the majority of rainfall that falls on land is actually originating in water that already fell as rain on the land previously. So this idea that water is recycled is key to understanding uh, rainfall. Of course these ratios uh, vary across the planet. So if you're in an oceanic island, most of your rainfall probably comes from the ocean. But if you're far inland in a continent, quite often we'll find that a lot of the rainfall that falls is actually water that's already fallen more than once and is re-evaporated into the atmosphere. And what you see in this map of the world is one summary based on various data sets suggesting where uh, this recycled water is most important and that's the dark uh, red color is where the ratio of recycled is particularly high. Uh, so you see that that includes large uh, areas of heavily populated land including uh, China, including large areas of the Sahel in Africa and also parts of South America. And those parts of South America are places that have been recently uh, experiencing quite severe droughts over the last uh, couple of years. So forests are a particularly effective source of atmospheric moisture. A lot of the rain that falls on forests will actually re-evaporate back into the atmosphere. And what we see if we look at the summary figures, of course, it varies from place to place, it varies with the forests, but generally forests are much more effective, often as much as 10 times more effective than other vegetation types, low vegetation, grassy areas, crops and the like, at actually re-emitting water back into the atmosphere. Uh, a lot of tropical forests, for example, will actually evaporate more than a meter per year and some even more than two meters of water equivalent per year. And this is actually more effective than even open water is. It's about twice the evaporation than we get uh, off open water areas. And they're able to do that because of the high leaf area they have in the canopy, high up in the, in the canopy of the forest. And it's a bit like why you hang your clothes on a clothesline to dry rather than laying them flat on the ground. When you hang them up, there's more wind, there's more movement the air actually manages to carry more water out of your clothes hanging on the clothesline. That's like the leaves on the tree. So that's, you can think of uh, trees as being a bit like machines. So here's just an interesting observation uh, based on data that if we look at transects in different parts of the world and look at how rainfall declines as we go inland from the coast, we see some different patterns. So here in this bottom figure, you see annual rainfall. Uh, this is in meters uh, in different parts of the world. And if we look at these yellow transects first in different parts of the world, as we move inland away from the 
ocean with the prevailing wind direction, we generally see uh, a decline in rainfall. And this is pretty much what you expect. As you go inland, there's less water because some of it has fallen as rain. Yes, some of it recycled, but also some of it, when it falls on the land surface, will disappear through rivers. And as we go inland, there's less and less moisture to recycle. So places become drier and drier. So we get this um, more or less exponential decline with distance. Of course, in reality, there's little um, jumps and glitches due to the fact that the land surface is varying. and there's, It's not perfectly flat, but these are the uh, fitted curves that you get with these data. Yet, if we look in other parts of the world where we get more or less continuous forest in from the coast, so for example in the Amazon Basin, that's A up here, this line here, instead of seeing this near exponential decline as we go uh, further inland, we actually get an almost a uh, constant or maybe a slight increase as we go inland. Similarly in the Congo Basin across the wet forests of the Congo, we don't see this sharp decline. And also in Siberia we have these huge massive forests. As we go inland, rainfall does not decline sharply with distance at all, but stays more or less constant and even increases slightly in this data set. So this is an empirical observation. This is not about theory. This is about what we actually see. So to actually try and explain this pattern, maybe one of the suggestions might be uh, that forests actually maybe attract rain. This is something that people believe in various parts of the world. But if you actually talk to climate experts, this is not what you see in climate models. In climate models, we don't have a clear mechanism that would allow that to occur. How would it be that forests could draw in rainfall? We can't really try and understand how rain gets into continental interiors if we don't really understand how the atmosphere carries that moisture in. So we have to really talk about wind. So typically when we talk about wind, we have really one explanation for where winds come from, and that's a temperature difference. And as in this diagram, we see that the land surface uh, warms up over the day, and as that happens, the air gets uh, hotter and expands and will rise like a hot air balloon will rise. And when it does that, the air pressure drops beneath and that draws in the cooler air off the oceans and as it draws in that air, that air will pick up moisture off the ocean and bring that moisture in with it. And as that air rises, warms and rises, any moisture in it will actually condense as the air rises and cools and as it condenses and cools forming clouds and potentially rain over the land surface. So we see this system is how we understand how uh, wind carries moisture in from the oceans fall as rain over the land surface. And this is really an idea that's uh, been understood for a very long time, basically since the 17th century when Edmund Haley first described it as the theory for global circulation and understanding of the trade winds. And since that time, maybe our understanding has become a bit more sophisticated in terms of uh, rotating planet, etc., and the different cell systems. But basically it's the same idea, the idea that the atmospheric motion is driven by the difference between the warmer parts of the world, particularly the tropics, and the colder parts of the world, such as the polar regions, and how the atmosphere redistributes, redistributes itself uh, with these temperature gradients. But perhaps temperature differences are not telling us the whole story. Two colleagues of mine, physicists Anastasia and Victor, came up with a theory that's actually more uh, relating to how uh, water vapor changes uh, in the atmosphere, becoming uh, a gas or becoming a liquid, depending on whether it evaporates or whether it condenses, and the effect that this has on global uh, atmospheric pressure gradients. And they've used this theory to actually explain how wind can be generated uh, by um, condensation. And we have called this theory for short the biotic pump because it's so important for understanding how forests are related to winds. And uh, I won't have time to go into the physics today, but just to say that it has been peer-reviewed. These ideas have been published in many physics journals. Here's just some examples of those. And we have an increasing number of publications also in climate journals, which says that people at least are taking these new ideas seriously. So one of the implications of this theory is that areas which actually have the highest evaporation also uh, develop the lowest pressure and that this draws in moist air and allows uh, wet areas to maintain themselves as wet to, through a positive feedback effect and this is important in understanding the 
uh, behavior and dynamics of tropical ocean storms, hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons and the like. And it's also important in understanding the climatic effects of forests and how forests influence rainfall patterns. And that, of course, is going to be the focus now. To try, just to try and briefly explain how it works, here's a diagram of a uh, vegetated land surface beside an ocean. So the vegetated surface here, there's some moisture evaporated into the air, but it's relatively low, whereas over the ocean there's reasonably high amounts of moisture coming off the ocean being evaporated into the air. So we will find on average that condensation occurs sooner here over the ocean because there's more moisture, and when condensation occurs, air pressure will drop. When air pressure here drops, it will draw the uh, atmosphere from elsewhere and any moisture it contains with it. And as it is drawn in, it, we have a process called convergence where the air starts to rise and any moisture it contains will also condense. So it creates a positive feedback, maintaining the rainfall over the ocean and drying out in this diagram, the land surface. Okay, so if we have forests, the situation is reversed. The amount of evaporation of the ocean is the same, but the evaporation over the forest is much higher than it was over the non-forested surface. So here we will get condensation occurring more regularly over the forested land. Condensation occurring more regularly means that on average there will be lower atmospheric pressure here occurring and this will draw in moist air from the nearby ocean feeding rainfall over the forest in this case. So notice there's nothing to do with temperature here. This is to do with the process of condensation occurring. And the nice thing about this uh, theory, if you do look at the physics and cal do the calculations, it actually allows us to actually explain how uh, rainfall can actually be drawn right into continental interiors. It's the process of evaporation of the forest coupled with local condensation taking place that uh, is able to draw wind in off the oceans right across the forest and maintain high rainfall even in the interior of continents. So one of the nice things about the biotic pump is it actually explains one of the challenges that climate scientists have, which is that when they currently run their global circulation models, their, their climate models that explain how the global uh, climate works, they actually find that the rainfall in the Amazon or the amount of water that comes out of the Amazon, that's the runoff from the Amazon basin in most of these models, is much less than what's actually seen in reality. So even the best models currently are giving us a typical runoff off out of the Amazon, which is about half of what's actually observed. So even though the Amazon has about 200,000 cubic meters of water per second traveling through it, these climate models are only able to account for about half of that 100,000 cubic meters per second. There's also other problems, such as in the islands of Indonesia. They will tell us that rainfall the models will tell us that rainfall over sea should be higher than what we see over land, and in fact what we see is the reverse. The rainfall over the land is higher than over the sea. And of course, why it would solve the problem is because the Baltic pump tells us that actually it's the forests that are drawing in the water, uh, the moist air, maintaining their own rainfall, which is missing in the current models. So the biotic pump has several important implications and first start with the uh, scary ones, that's the risks. The idea that actually losing forests can actually switch off the positive feedbacks that uh, bring rainfall into continental interiors and the idea that actually we need more or less continuous forest cover into continental interiors to maintain rainfall and that if we degrade the forest too much switching is possible. We could imagine a situation where the forest is degraded it gets drier because there's less rain, there's more fires, and as we get into that cycle of degradation, ultimately we no longer have a strong positive uh, effect of the forest drawing in uh, wind from the oceans, and actually we can switch to a dry system where now the oceans become more effective than the continental surface, and most of the wind will now be from the land to the oceans, now drawing the moisture away. So we lose that positive feedback, and now we end up with, a, instead of a wet continent, a dry continent. There's also the positive opportunities of recognizing these linkages between forests and rain, that we see a whole new regional value in forests. We could imagine, uh, if we're farmers, that we would be now concerned about the forests upwind of us that provide our moisture, but also 
the forest downwind that actually are generating the wind that carries that moisture to us. So that brings a whole new set of people who should be interested and concerned about maintaining forest and tree cover in, uh, because of the value it brings in terms of maintaining rainfall. The Baltic pump also tells us that we have a mechanism which could be powerful enough to turn areas that are currently dry green again if we are able to plant trees in the right way, working with prevailing wind directions, we could imagine turning a desert green through planting trees suitably. We also see that actually using trees, maintaining forests and planting trees is actually a positive way that we can go about addressing the current global concerns about water scarcity and unreliability. And of course, at the same time, there are benefits in terms of carbon, in terms of biodiversity and all the other benefits that we're used to talking about with forests and trees. So that's a positive opportunity. That's all the presentations from Douglas. Uh, so Douglas, please stay with us after one more presentation from Jan that will be presented virtually from here by Professor Maina Fat Nordwick. So just stay with us, Douglas, and then we will have a questions and answer session with you. Peter, are you there? Yes, yes, Lynn, we are there. So um, um, we followed keenly uh, Douglas's presentation. Thanks, Douglas. Um, maybe um, Tony is in the room, so maybe he has a, one or two you know, observations before we get the next uh, presenter. Looking at uh, today's presentation from, from Douglas and from the summary minor presented of yesterday and the couple of talks that I heard yesterday, it is very clear that, that water, uh, along with carbon and along with forests, are largely or is largely unaccounted for. It's unaccounted for in GDP, it's unaccounted for in market prices, and it's unaccounted for in a lot of the global models that decision makers are taking their decisions on. And I think you know the interesting follow-up from this meeting will be how we can link that those unaccounted for, those, those um, negative externalities, particularly if we get it wrong, if we do something um, um, damaging or imperialist to those uh, carbon, water, and um, forest uh, domains, of how we, how we address that. Um, we hear with carbon that carbon the real price of carbon is somewhere between 60 and $200 a ton. Well, if it takes 200,000 liters of water to produce one ton of CO2 equivalent, then does that mean that we're pricing water at one two hundred thousandths per liter of that? Um, and if we are to look at um, that relationship between forest and, and as a land cover, not just for the water, but but as a resource, what's the, what's the average price of a hectare of tropical rainforest? Um, $5,000 a hectare, $10,000 a hectare, $20,000 a hectare? Let's say it was $10,000, just, just probably just on the, on the wholesale value of, of <clears throat> 300 or 200 cubic meters of wood. Well, it would be, that means that, that countries that have deforested to plant oil palm or rubber or cocoa or coffee have actually lost more on their balance sheet than they've gained. And this balance and this water balance sheet that, that the speakers have been alluded to is, is, is incredibly interesting and raises a lot of questions going forward about how we frame our own research agenda. Thank you, Tony. I have the honor in a virtual symposium to be the virtual version of Jan Pokorny and speak to the slides that he presented. And I apologize up front that I, I will miss the, you will miss the nice accent with which Jan speaks his English and get a, a Dutch version that you've already heard before. But we really have cool insights that come from this work on the Earth's surface temperature and the very compelling way of imagery of showing that to people what it looks like, which really shows that vegetation cools. And the fundamental role played by water and vegetation in the climate is indeed that direct cooling effect that we have only partially represented in the current models and our current understanding. 
um, partly because the weather stations excluded that effect for a long time. So the basic content is if we start the energy, the solar energy is driving the whole hydrological cycle, um, and there is variation in that that we need to know. It's the balance between evaporation, water going from um, liquid to vapor, and, and vice versa that has big effects on the temperature. And we can really see this as the air conditioning part, and it will sh end up with showing these thermal pictures. So if we do the basic balance of the solar energy arriving at the surface of, of or the top of the atmosphere, then there is variation between seasons, as we see here in, in the difference between January and July, and there's difference between years, and there is parts on that. Um, there is variation between many factors in the detail of solar energy at the same time um, that is driving the hydrological cycle. Um, the accuracy with which we can measure soli solar irradiance is about 1% at the moment. Well, you've seen pictures like this before explaining the greenhouse gas effect, how green greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, interact with that. But of course, clouds and water vapor is, has a, an even stronger effect on that than um, gases like CO2 and, and N2O. And we can relate the radiative forcing to the temperature of any specific place by looking at what is reflected and what comes into it. And of course, we all know that if we compare a cloudy day on the bottom of the graph with a sunny day, that we have very different levels of irradiance reaching the soil surface. Well, the cooling effect of these clouds, can, we can get a sense of that if we look at nuclear power stations, as we still have in the Czech Republic. Um, and you see that they actually need a lot of water cooling to keep the nuclear power things going. And we get a sense of um, the amount of water that they need to evaporate to cool the system and to keep it, and compare that with the cooling that happens on a unit of land area. And what we get if we combine this, the solar energy flux with the water balance, we can see the two things that um, there is a lot of if we co would compare on the left-hand side the drained field where the evapotranspiration is relatively low, we see that it produces a lot of heat, whereas the place, the patch on the right-hand side with trees and ponds of water, um, they evaporate a lot of water, and that is called latent heat, but it actually means cooling effects. Um, so there's a direct link between the evapotranspiration and the heat flux, and we get a sense of the amount of energy involved with energy consumption um, when we vaporize, when we con go from liquid to vapor, and at the same time, um, energy release and the, in the reverse process. So condensation um, takes energy, whereas, uh, no, vaporizing takes energy where condensation produces, and I think that's partly linked to what Douglas was talking in the previous talk about. Well, these things are not particularly no, they have been, been understood for quite a while. And we, when we go back to the thermodynamic analysis of the past, we can see that temperature and water are directly linked. But it has not yet fully been fully applied to land cover types and land cover surfaces. And the group of Jan has been working on thermal imagery by various ways, in this case balloons that took with thermal cam cameras recorded the the surface temperature of landscapes in summer in the Czech Republic, as we see here, and study that during the day. And what we see here is graphs of the, the daily uh, warming and cooling that we see over patches in that same landscape, and it's all exposed to the same solar radiation. It's in the same location. But we see, obviously, that the asphalt, the Termac Road, is by far the hottest in the middle of the day, and the forest is slightly warmer than the open water, um, but not that different from it. An older stand is in the same, the a wet meadow is still um, evaporating quite a lot, transpiring a lot of water, but a harvested meadow, which is a dry patch, is actually getting very hot during that part of the day. And uh, one of these figures is included in the paper by David Allison that we are discussing here. So the remarkable thing is that at short distance from each other, <coughs> we have very different surface temperatures. 
At the same time, if you walk in the landscape yourself, <coughs> these things are not a surprise. You can easily see it and feel it. But if we look at the, the daily range of temperature and the surface temperature, um, we see easily differences between vegetation and land cover types of 15 degrees, in some cases even more than that. Yeah, And we, we get to the temperature that people feel and experience is not the same as the temperature that the weather station has been recorded. It's not the temperature that you see on the climate maps. There's a wide range of actual temperatures that, that occur. And changes in land cover are directly linked to that surface temperature and, and are a way to manage the, the temperature under which people live. Now, a further application that, that Jan has been involved with is a study of what it means in the Mao forest in Kenya. And of course, all our colleagues in, in Nairobi will be very much aware of how hot the discussion about the Mao forest has been. Um, this is a contribution on the, on the biophysical side of that story, um, and which is, has been published in 2010. Yeah, so the Mao forest is one of the few remaining closed canopy forests within Kenya. Um, and it feeds 12 rivers that, that, that feed into six lakes. And it is an important part of the hydrology of Kenya. Um, at the same time, the, the discussion about it was heating up a lot when a new hydropower plant was constructed um, that required, needed the water generated from the Mao forest. Um, and it brought back this awareness that actually there is a lot of encroachment, a lot of conversion of the Mao forest going. And the government decided to evict people from that, which has led to many discussions and conflicts on the social side. On the hydrological side, we can see that this is a, a color image interpretation of, of the thermal part, that we see that the forests stand out as having a very different temperature than the farmland that is adjacent to it. And on the ground, which if you go there, you see many um, evidence that people are cutting trees, are using it as firewood, are taking it out in smaller scales. At the same time, a lot of the forest is converted to, to farmland and to half open vegetation, which has consequences on the ground for local livelihoods. But it also has influences on the water and the hydropower supply coming from that landscape. But we can also, and that is the work that we contributed here, and it has direct effects for the surface temperature and the cooling part on this. And this is an analysis of the land surface temperatures um, influence that, that of the forest conversion that has taken place. And yeah, um, there is in the paper the detail of, of what it looks like on the ground. But the, the, a, a, a strong shift from closed canopy forest to open vegetation. And we see that back in um, the temperature pictures of that area. And it, in that way, it, it has impact on the surrounding landscape as well. So um, this is somehow related to the previous speaker, to Doug, who talked about the, the, the water pump theory. Um, actually, people within the Mao Forest area themselves are, they have read the papers of Douglas Shield and Mordiar, so no. Um, but they are convinced that forest does indeed attract rainfall, and they have decided to keep a 600 hectare patch of a forest intact for it. Um, and yeah, what the group here has been doing is taking thermal pictures of that area and seeing whether that matches the, the local perceptions of what it would do. And these are pictures taken from an, an infrared camera on, on an airplane. And indeed, we see strong effects on the temperature. Um, this on the, is the, an example of the deforested part, where you see a lot of reds and yellows coming in. And the darker colors here are the, the closed canopy forest, which still has intact evapotranspiration. If you compare that with an agriculture field, um, you see even within an agriculture field, there are hotter and even hotter places. There's variation on that front. But it is in a very different category from, from vegetation that has a high rate of evapotranspiration. So I think the main message coming out of that work is that it is possible to visualize the surface temperature, that these infrared pictures combined with normal pictures 
and do help and make the story very clear to people <coughs> that forests are cool, that evapotranspiration is a cooling effect, and that we can, <coughs> in that way, relate, directly relate the hydrological cycle to temperature, and it, this does seem to be aligned with the, 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 the makarieva gorshkov biotic pump theory that Douglas was explaining to us before. We can also take this into the further analysis, and that links back to Cindy's presentation yesterday of thunderstorms, cyclones, and winds and heavy rains on that front, um, and see that temperature itself is the cause of turbulence in the atmosphere and links back to the pattern of rainfall that we see. Now, um, on the physics side, we can quantify the fluxes of energy linked to the fluxes of water in this part, and um, yeah, it, it, it supports the basic concept of bringing back vegetation, bringing back water use as a way of cooling the planet. If you take the same methodology to the urban areas, you see huge differences in temperature in the same place. Um, these are more or less the same time pictures. On the thermal picture, you see a person on the normal picture, not. Um, but there are these effects going on. So. I think the bottom line of the presentation is that that cooling effect is very well understood in physics. Um, it is very well understood in peop anyone who plants trees around their own place to keep it cool. Um, it is not completely represented in the current climate data because they have been collected on places without trees, and it is not fully un incorporated in the current generation of climate change models. But there is a clear link between what people on the ground um, think and believe and why they want to keep forest and our current understanding of these processes. And again, I apologize for the many points I missed if Jan would have given this talk himself. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Pamaina. Shall we give a applause to Pamaina real, in real term? Now we are ready for the questions and answer session. So we have some audience here. So if you want to ask questions, please grab some metal cards and, um, uh, and hand it to our facilitator. And for audience online, please write down your questions on the, uh, the chat room. And for the time being, uh, may I ask Peter if is there any question from your audience, Peter? There is a point for discussion from uh, Mehmood, not necessarily a question. Okay. Okay, Mehmood, please. Thank you very much. Very interesting set of presentations, and Maine, you summarized yesterday's uh, messages very beautifully, and it again brings us to the same old problem we are uh, struggling to solve is the disciplinary versus multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary versus transdisciplinarity. Hydrologists so far, uh, un uh, until yesterday perhaps, or <laughs> last year, do not consider all these other dimensions of uh, how rains get uh, distributed, how water cycle gets kind of uh, changed with the help of or due to trees and the vegetation. Uh, today we also learned that physics very well understands the cooling effect due to trees and uh, vegetation. Uh, so you asked the question in the beginning, so do we have enough knowledge to act? I, I think we, we, we do have some actionable knowledge and which would be me at least to take it to agencies or networks like International Network of Basin Organizations because those are the guys who deal with whose members are these transboundary basin organizations and they look forward to all these insights from research on water that has transboundary implications. So maybe within FTA and other networks and uh, programs we can do something that this knowledge is tabled, discussed uh, at, at uh, networks like uh, International Network of Basin Organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. 
So Mahmoud, he is the capacity building head of aircraft in Nairobi, based in Nairobi. So we have a question from Paul McKean to Yan. So hopefully we can communicate to Yan, otherwise um, Maina maybe can provide some answer briefly. So the yeah. question is that, can you expect satellite infrared resolution to match your findings as to conduct very large scale surveys? So Paul is interested in groundwater inputs into rivers and streams in the tropics. For example, groundwater would expect it to be cooler than surface water in many cases. Groundwater may have carbon dioxide many magnitudes higher than surface water. So maybe this is also another, uh, there is another question coming here. I don't know from whom, but it's from the audience. Uh, the question is uh, the same in the same uh, page. Uh, I think it's also for Yan, but maybe Douglas also can contribute. How does the albedo effects fit in this picture? Yeah, maybe Doug can start. Uh, maybe Douglas can start on the the questions because Jan is communicating with us, but we will. Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. Jan. Uh, yeah. Jan uh, is uh, typing here. Uh, Jan mentioned that pixel of the landsat is about one hectare, so you need about two hundred hectares area for study. That's um, from Jan. And. Uh, Mamena, do you have any additions? Or Douglas? Douglas, are you there? Yeah. It's, it's not really my subject, infrared photography. Okay. <laughs> Better you ask Jan. Yeah. yeah. Jan is typing, but m maybe Douglas, the effect of the albedo of the, how much vegetation is reflecting solar energy, um, you can comment on that, how that links to the biotic pump, or is that too far? Uh, yeah, no, certainly it's an important uh, relationship. I, I think what, what often comes up when I've been discussing this with people is we talk about the albedo of the land surface and we forget the albedo of the clouds which the land surface is responsible for. So there's this link between the land surface and cloud formation which has to be factored into the albedo equation which is generally missing in so many discussions at the moment. If we know that vegetation can be promoting clouds, like the work that Cindy was talking about yesterday, and we haven't talked about the other chemistry kind of of the atmosphere effects where vegetation can be influencing cloud formation. But of course, clouds are one of the best ways to reflect solar energy back into the back into space. So clouds are one of the best uh, ways to actually influence the energy balance. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go to Nairobi. Peter, are you there? Yeah, um, yes, we're here. Um, I can't see any questions, but maybe I'll, 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 I'll tease, um, ask a question to uh, um, Douglas uh, um, at the moment. Um, Douglas, I kind of liked your map with the transects um, that looked at, you know, their uh, transects and looked at, at, at rainfall uh, patterns. One, one interesting question that I'll ask in terms of looking at the future, looking at sort of uh, uh, maybe empirical evidence or modeling approaches, what would be your take if you went back to look at places where we've had massive um, um, reforestation uh, projects going on um, and, and looking whether we can look at climate history, I mean at, at climate history and look at rainfall in particular, um, and, and would we be able to, to see the, ra the, the forest attracting rainfall again in that sense? Is th has that been done in, 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 in the kind of work that you do? Uh, I would say it hasn't been done very satisfactorily so far. Uh, th there's various data sets showing that when we lose forest cover, we lose rain, but I'm not aware of any strong data sets where we actually have a long time series showing the effects of reforestation. So uh, definitely if such data sets exist, I would be very interested to find them. 
But I guess part of the problem also is whenever you just have a correlation, for example, increasing forest cover and increasing rain, there's always going to be many different other background factors which could plausibly be part of the explanation. It's hard in one study to, to prove these relationships. So uh, that, that, that remains part of the challenge, I guess, is finding these good data sets which people might find convincing. It's definitely something we should do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, we got some information more from Jan. It's answering Paul's um, questions about the infrared. Uh, Jan mentioned that thermal pixel of Landsat is one hectare in size. So you see surface temperature, yes, groundwater would be cooler. You can see trunks of trees cooler and how they take groundwater. Landsat images are available from late 1980s. So we can study changes of temperatures caused by land, use, land cover changes. There's a follow-up question from Paul. For Jan, that is. Oh yeah, and then Paul also, also asked whether um, there will be any progressions in satellite technology that will make this possible in the near future. And Yen will type for the answer, I believe. So, well, um, maybe we can pick up on on the discussion topic that Mahmoud brought of this point of, with this type of information, um, who, who would be interested to to act on it? Clearly, there is a lot of further detail that the scientists can and should clarify and elaborate. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, some of the very basic points that we're making here about um, effects, be the link between the water balance and the energy balance and the cooling effects of trees at the local scale is beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, the, ef the effect of evapotranspiration as being the source of rainfall as such is beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, so the, the, the basic principles we discuss here are certain the specific translation about how, what percent of rainfall can be increased by this or that, um, that, that remains uncertain. So I think Mahmoud's idea that, that yeah, these transboundary basin organizations may be a good starting point, that they are already familiar with this part. Um, yesterday we had several discussions on the Nile, and, and of course so far the Nile discussion has been a blue water debate about water in the river. If we can take them to understand the the full cycle, that would be a very good starting point. In terms of interdisciplinarity, clearly, um, we do need the physical understanding, we need, do need the climate people, but we equally need the political understanding of what it means in a geopolitical frame and the social part and the economics, as, as Tony's are bringing in. So this is really a primary area where we, we can come together with many different pieces of the puzzle and see how the whole thing fits together. Yes, but yep. interesting points. And yeah, while we are waiting for another uh, participants to give us some some questions, so I think it will be, I would like to pick up on uh, Douglas' uh, map on the recycling ratio. It's very interesting. Yesterday you mentioned that uh, somehow monitoring the watershed functions is very uncertain. And how do you think that uh, this type of information can also provide some indicators for any incentive base or um, payment for ecosystem services type of mechanism uh, having such information uh, using the transboundary, um, transboundary locations? Uh, do you think that this is somehow relevant? I, I, I think the problem we still have with, with the biotic pump at the moment is, is with all the discussion currently focused on these global circulation models and the global climate models, until those models actually reflect some of these relationships, it's going to be very difficult to actually get them, uh, very difficult to get these processes adequately reflected in the kinds of projections that uh, the people are currently generating. 
So, so right now for us, I guess that's the focus, is trying to um, ensure that these theories get the proper recognition. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there is so much focus on the, uh, the, these models at the moment that until the models actually reflect these, these relationships, I, I think we're a little bit stuck. So, so that's where we are focused at the moment. Yeah, we still have a lot of homework, yeah, the scientists. Uh, there will be another question for you, Douglas. Uh, be ready from Peter. Please, Peter. Um, thanks, Douglas. Um, we have a question from uh, Marku Larjavara online, um, and he's asking the following question. He says, increasing CO2 lowers plant transpiration as they do not have to keep their stomata open as much, other, other things being equal, that is. Um, has this been discussed in the, bio, in the biotic pump context? Is it possible? that even without deforestation, these pumps would be weakening? I think it, it's a good point. I mean, it, it, has, it has been mentioned, but we don't know, perhaps we still don't know enough about all of these relationships to really have a strong, a strong prediction, but definitely the idea that the relationship could be weakening makes sense. I mean, as, as the simplistic relationship that the, the, the the plants can close their stomata more and conserve water and get the same amount of carbon. Uh, definitely there is that potential and that, that, would, that would weaken the biotic pump. But there are many other relationships that will also be changing at the same time with atmospheric change, with temperature change. So it's very hard to make a clear, a clear total prediction as to what's going to happen in any one site without considering all the other variables. Thank you, thank you very much. Lay? Yes, there is another question from David Ellison. Is David, yeah, David uh, yes, David seems online. So David asks whether what is the net effects of rising temperature, which also drives more evapotranspiration in addition to CO2 or carbon dioxide increase. So what is the net, net effects of rising temperature? So either Douglas or yeah, Yan, hopefully Yan can type, or Pak Maini, you want to contribute? Douglas, do you want to comment? I think I, I can say something briefly. Sorry, does Maina want to go? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Douglas. I, I, again, I, I guess it's fairly complex. It, it really depends to what extent the, the vegetation itself is able to cope with the temperature increases. Uh, to, a, to a certain degree, we might expect that as temperature rises, plants will actually be able to transpire more as long as the, the water is there. <laughs> but as plants get stressed, they will also yeah. be inclined to close their stomata. And if we actually get some kind of dieback, obviously, there's ultimately going to be a reduction in the leaf area of the vegetation and a change in vegetation. So it very much depends on the degree of stress in the vegetation. And there's some additional relationships which we haven't talked about, but I think that are very important in the context of heat stress, that we know, for example, that tropical forests, they also affect clouds by some of the chemicals they emit into the atmosphere. This isn't just the bacteria that Cindy was talking about yesterday, but organic compounds that they will emit when they're stressed. And we know that those compounds um, that are emitted into the atmosphere will also affect uh, atmospheric condensation and can lead to cloud formation. So there are feedbacks going on within the, the forest system itself which can actually protect the forest at least to some degree from, uh, from heat. So it also depends to what degree the forest can actually cope with these uh, stressful moments where the temperature is rising. Okay, um, there is another question to Douglas. Douglas, uh, be ready. So it's from Emilio de los Rios. What is the effect on the soil water balance of the biotic pump? Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, it depends again a, a lot on the specific system we're dealing with. Uh, um, you, can, you can imagine that forests often have incredibly uh, deep roots. So what we're talking about in terms of available water for a tree can be very, very deep in the, in the soil profile. So this is much deeper than we normally talk about when we talk about water balance. But I know that uh, work that's been done with isotopic uh, fractionation of moisture and the like, we see 
that even in deserts, trees can be a major source of atmospheric water because they're able to access water maybe more than 50 meters down in the soil profile. So I, I guess we really haven't studied these things very well, but if there is available water that's, and the trees can access it, then obviously the trees will con continue to transpire. It depends a lot on what the trees can root in and whether they can access moisture, and that will depend a lot on the specific situation. But obviously if there is no moisture, then the biotic pump uh, cannot uh, function. If the plants cannot transpire moisture, then the biotic pump is switched off. There is nothing to generate the moisture. Thank you. Maybe, maybe Minor would like to say something on the water balance. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, one, one point here is that some lessons that we can learn from the haze experience that we've seen in, in, for example, in Indonesia, where, of course, haze is clouds that don't rain. Yeah? So during periods with, with heavy haze, of course, the energy reaching the plants is much reduced. Um, at the same time, they don't need as much water to evaporate um, because of that either. Now, we have increasing evidence now that these effect, these periods with low radiation on forest actually lead to substantial shifts in the tree phenology itself. And for one year after, the first year after haze effect, we don't get any fruits in the forest, and we see the orangutans and other forest biota suffer from that effect in a direct way, and that is stuff that is emerging right now. Yeah, so within our understanding of, of clouds, we, we now talk about the clouds that cause rain, but the clouds and the haze that, that has that effect on solar radiation without rainfall is, is quite relevant as well. And it is cooling, um, and it is somehow protecting vegetation from the immediate drought that, that is associated with it. At the same time, it has prolonged effects through the trees themselves and the, and the energy balance within the tree. And certainly those effects are not yet included in our current model representations of it. And they have not been included when people look at the, the damage of these haze periods, that we have these knock-on effects on how the vegetation functions. So there is a lot of detail in the, in the physiology of trees in the way these things function at that level that is not, not adequately rep represented. At the same time, in the overall, the overall part, the message is, of course, fairly obvious in terms of, of keep ex intact forest where you can um, and try to use tree cover elsewhere where, where it can suit your purpose. And I think the basic ideas for that are sufficiently understood to act upon. Um, um, thanks, Maina. I think we, we, we also have a, a response from Jan on, on the same, uh, along the same lines on, on structure. Uh, Jan says crucial uh, vegeta vegeta vertical structure of vegetation is crucial. Forest has inversion temperature, lower down and higher at the crowns. Developed forest keeps water in canopy. Crops, crop plants with bare soil have higher temperature down on the soil and lower at the top of the stand. So warm soils heat air which rises and still sue in, in quote unquote water from crop canopy. So it's really going back to Minor's point on, on, on the structure of, of the, 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 the vegetation as well. Not only the plant, but the whole vegetation structure. Douglas, do you have any last points before we close the questions and answer session? I, I think we're fine, thank you. If anybody's interested in these topics and wants to know more, feel free to contact me. Okay, thank you, Douglas. How about you, Pap Mamina? Well, uh, no, I, th I think that the points will come up in the next part when we get into the local knowledge, and I think Victoria will take us through that part. So, thank you. Yeah, well, we are waiting for Victoria to be ready. So, it will be interesting to know beyond the technicalities, while as uh, Mamina mentions that Victoria will introduce some information on how the local knowledge also can connect into those uh, informations that we uh, inform uh, previously. So Victoria from We Forest, she will provide you a presentation titled with Implications for Forest Landscape Restoration. Victoria, are you there? Yes, hello. 
Yes, Victoria. So please uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to move the sort of play with the presentation from Bogor as well as speak to it directly. Um, in this talk, uh, I, I want to focus on, on how the current understanding of forest water climate interactions affect uh, forest landscape restoration or FLR and uh, how FLR may offer an opportunity as a potentially suitable avenue uh, to integrate current knowledge in, in mainstream uh, discourse. I'll consider how FLR as a climate mitigation solution has uh, relied on carbon-centered messages but more importantly, and linking back uh, to the discussion we began yesterday, uh, reflect on what makes the approach attractive in moving forward with the climate forest uh, water, with the forest water climate agenda. Um, we Forest is an international NGO uh, that is dedicated to the restoration of tropical forest landscapes. It uh, develops and implements projects in, in a number of countries using a forest landscape restoration approach with a view to mitigate uh, climate change, but also uh, thinking of uh, adaptation. As it, um, as it may be the case that uh, not everybody uh, attending the webinar is, is familiar with the concept of forest landscape restoration, I think it is uh, worth mentioning that the term um, FLR refers to the process, ongoing process, of regaining ecological functionality and enhancing human well-being across deforested or degraded forest landscapes. It is uh, proposed as one of the most cost-effective climate solutions that we have available today. FLR moves away uh, from the um, site-based approach to emphasize that forests are part of a uh, dynamic and multifunctional landscape. There are 10 accepted, widely accepted principles that FLI incorporates in its approach. These uh, principles include the notion of adaptive management, the relevance of multi-stakeholder involvement, acknowledges that restoration may be conducted for multiple purposes and therefore lead to multiple benefits. It should be a collaborative process and therefore both a socio-political and uh, a technical intervention. FLR works through several approaches, including uh, agroforestry. It uh, um, can involve natural and assisted natural regeneration. It uh, can be connecting forest fragments, direct planting, etc. So it covers a whole range of methodologies. It sits well with the international framework um, and also with the global commitments since it can deliver on, on climate objectives both on mitigation and uh, adaptation. It is uh, supported by the international community because it offers countries a way to achieve um, the Aichi biodiversity targets, the, the SDGs, um, contribute to the bond challenge, and also uh, to the New York Declaration on, on Forests. Um, and I, I guess the, uh, the, the point here is that current mainstream discourses that uh, connect forest landscape restoration to the climate change mitigation um, center, basically center around two pathways that contribute to climate change mitigation. One where FLR serves to mitigate climate change through carbon sequestration, that is through capture and storage. And the second pathway where FLR projects integrate solutions that reduce emissions to the atmosphere. For example, interventions that promote energy efficient stoves or other schemes that are designed to reduce wood fuel consumption. Mechanisms that uh, associate forest, water and climate are from missing and neglected in, in key reviews and, and publications. The, the omission is also sustained throughout um, other stakeholder groups such as the, the corporate and the business sector where climate mitigation is defined as a reduction of greenhouse gases emitted by the company's uh, operation. And um, as, as corporate and business uh, sectors have adopted the clean development mechanism, the climate carbon-centered understanding uh, has become prevalent in, in the corporate uh, responsibility discourse. 
and uh, it is represented in corporate climate mitigation commitments and hence also in the financing uh, framework, which, which I think we, we haven't uh, referred to or, or spoken about. Um, just um, to, to provide, uh, also to illustrate with an example, I think even when the private sector uh, take initiative and they seek to integrate uh, a wide understanding of ecosystem services from forests, there is, they very much still rely on the carbon footprint reduction as the main tool for tackling climate change. Although there is a, a wider in interest in incorporating other ecosystem services, such as water. For example, um, the international in, uh, platform for insetting that was launched in, at the COP21 in Paris, um, it aims to develop and certify insetting projects worldwide. Uh, and this involves the reduction and reducing the footprint with, uh, within the company's own value chain, which is driven by uh, carbon footprint. Um, we forest interest in uh, forest, water and climate interaction stems uh, very much from its mission to tackle uh, climate change. Being familiar with some of the debate, uh, we forest in collaboration with KU Leuven organized uh, the expert workshop in, in 2015 to review um, the state of knowledge that relates to forest, water and climate interactions. The meeting led to the policy brief uh, managing forest for water and climate cooling, as well as to the recently uh, published paper. The policy brief was written with the aim uh, to convey uh, current scientific knowledge to policymakers, uh, forest managers, and professionals with responsibilities in the implementation sector, including FNR professionals. We provided some recommendations and uh, called for action. Um, but asking professionals to pay attention to key issues for managing, water, uh, managing forests for water and climate was a, a first step to improve awareness. But uh, we realized, however, that the message is, is, uh, remains uh, elusive for direct application. It is uh, perhaps too general and limited uh, for application outside uh, research. So decision makers, I think, need more guidance to apply knowledge to their specific context. And uh, the paper that has just been published, I think, um, substantiates the content of, of the issues raised in, in the brief, adding depth and uh, analysis. Uh, but I, I think more work, we need to think about um, how to um, improve uh, awareness beyond uh, the distribution, the dissemination of, of information. Um, the paper um, raises multiple implications for forest lands landscape restoration practice and climate mitigation. Any climate mitigation strategy that relies on FLR must uh, play, pay close attention to forest water climate relationship since the net um, climate mitigation effect of forest depends on, on complex relationships, complex trade-offs between evapotranspiration, surface and cloud albedo as uh, Douglas was talking about carbon sequestration as well as, as other factors. One caveat worth noting is that not all FLR will have a net climate mitigation effect. That is, not all FLR will contribute to climate change mitigation. So for example, we know that compared to high lat latitude regions, tropical latitudes are more likely to be effective in cooling climate. Therefore, um, International strategies that seek to mitigate climate change may find greater success by focusing efforts in tropical latitudes where net cooling effects are, are, are more likely to be observed. The advantage of FLR is that it can serve multiple purposes. It um, can serve purposes beyond climate, uh, miti climate change mitigation and it is also a powerful uh, approach for addressing uh, climate uh, adaptation. And uh, I want to show here some of the social, economic, and environmental benefits that can be attained through forest landscape restoration. To achieve these multiple impacts and benefits, again, the knowledge of water and energy cycle impacts is vital. For example, we heard yesterday about how soils infiltration capacity and, as a consequence, the groundwater recharge can be improved in degraded landscapes when infiltration and evapotranspiration rates are taken into consideration. To 
illustrate um, how current knowledge can be applied on, on, on the ground, I want to refer to a pilot study that is being conducted in California, um, where um, published by Ellison and, and, and Leighton. Research, researchers here are studying the processes that can lead to the increase of regional precipitation in coastal marginal drylands in, in California. So the paper uh, describes um, an afforestation pilot project that is irrigated with wastewater sources to increase local evapotranspiration. And uh, the assumption is that the natural orography, the, the hills and the mountains in, in, the, in the area can increase the likelihood that a, a greater share of evapotranspiration will condense and precipitate locally. The use of wastewater is, is very interesting because it doesn't compromise downstream water availability. So it, it also can save um, costs of, of water um, um, recycling and, and, and um, uh, improving. And, and also the expectation is that increased precipitation runoff and the transport of atmospheric moisture will serve to increase tree cover in, in the region, improving therefore both water quality and water security. There are, however, many gaps in knowledge that affect uh, implementation. For example, there are still questions concerning the, the minimum scale that is required for an intervention to have a specific effect on evapotranspiration. And um, thinking about um, other examples um, uh, that take a very different uh, perspective, um, I, I want to sort of mention um, the, um, the project that WeForest is um, supporting in Northeast India. This is a forest landscape restoration project and um, we work directly with the indigenous communities that um, are spread in the project spread across 56 villages and the, the communities decide which degraded forest areas are to be set aside for assisted natural regeneration and enrichment planting. So one of our objectives this year is to ascertain whether the selection of the restoration sites uh, conducted by the communities is well aligned with forest and, and water objectives, whether this selection is indeed favouring or optimising water availability, which is a problem in the area. So one of the things that we want to do in collaboration with FAO's Forest and Water Programme is um, delivering a capacity building workshop uh, next month to raise awareness among locals uh, about forest water interactions and, uh, and also monitoring with the view that this will inform their decision making process. The, the integration of, of forest water agenda in community driven projects um, poses quite a few challenges uh, because communities need to be brought on, on board um, to, be, um, to make a project um, effective. So it will require special tools and uh, capacity building. Um, so to, to sum up some of the points that I've made, I think um, one of the key points I want to make is that as an avenue to integrate current scientific knowledge and mainstream thinking, FLR is, is well placed, well positioned and offers uh, interesting opportunities. It focuses on multifunctionality and resilience, makes it uh, quite suitable to address climate mitigation and adaptation at both subnational and national scale. It is suited to address the socioeconomic and the uh, governance objectives of stakeholders, uh, the principles of inter uh, interdependency and cross-sectoral dialogue also serve the purpose of forest water, uh, of the forest water climate agenda. It can be argued that FLR meets almost all SDGs, which again is, is useful to communicate about in um, about the forest and water climate uh, impacts. Um, so I think in order to facilitate the shift in, in, in practice, we will need to we will also need the tools that help translate the body of scientific knowledge into uh, practical guidelines and the tools that serve the decision-making uh, process, the monitoring, etc. This, I think, will be uh, the next uh, challenge. As the business and the investment sector also are part of the mainstream discourse, I, I think there may be opportunities here as well to enlist corporate interest uh, in seeking a wider uh, set of approaches that can account for impacts that include 
forest and and water interactions. And I think that uh, the the business sector is already looking for for solutions um, to to make this this happen. Um, the tools required by by these stakeholder groups may be somewhat more related to economic risk. So this is something again that uh, needs to be uh, considered. To illustrate um, this, th these points with, with an example, I think there's, there's an option to build on existing tools rather than to develop entirely new, new methods or, or frameworks that can integrate current scientific understanding with, with what we are working with at the moment. For example, the uh, ROOT, uh, which um, stands for Restoration Opportunities Optimization Tool, um, it was developed uh, by IUCN and the Natural Capital Project and launched in uh, um, late 2016 to help uh, decision makers and planners at national and uh, regional scale select the best restoration areas according to specific objectives, taking into account trade-offs and uh, synergies between multiple objectives for restoration. The focus again um, is limited uh, because the, the focus is on carbon storage, water quality that's assessed using sedimentation data, species richness, and agricultural opportunity costs. So a tool that can help um, create richer, but not necessarily more complicated maps would be extremely uh, helpful um, for decision makers, planners, developers, and of course, uh, investors. And. Um, and I think this is, uh, I'm going to finish here. Um, thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Victoria. Let's give Victoria an applause. <laughs> um, so um, we, we don't know if we will try. Thank you, uh, Victoria. We'll just, just hold on and we'll try and and, and link up with the next speaker. But we'll take all three speakers before we take questions, right? So please, we want to remind people um, to keep putting on their questions on the, 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 the um, trees are cool um, chat. So please keep on. We'll come back to the questions as soon as we finish with the next two speakers. Um, we'd like to call on Elian uh, Spring Springe, who is uh, a forestry officer uh, for forest and water at uh, FAO. So, I don't know, Eliane, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Greetings from Rome. Okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, welcome. So, will you, I think you just go. Um, we'll take your presentation and then we'll come back to you later on. Thanks a lot for being there. Thanks. Great. Over Thank to you, you please. for having me. My name is Elaine Springe. I'm the Forestry Officer for Forests and Water at FAO, based at our headquarters in Rome, Italy. I've been asked to talk about forests and water and policy, primarily at the international level, but I'll also discuss a little on, on national policies. Before I begin, I would like to compliment the presentations of colleagues and briefly share with you some of the key messages we share with decision makers to advocate for the importance for forests and water. It's estimated that 80% of the global population live in areas where water resources are insecure, albeit uh, lack of infrastructure, seasonality, etc. And according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, Forested watersheds and wetlands supply 75% of our accessible fresh water. But as our populations become increasingly urbanized and grow steadily, it's important to note that at least one third of our world's largest cities, or hundreds of millions of people, rely on protected forested areas for a significant proportion of their drinking water. And many more people are reliant on water from forested watersheds that are not formally in protected status. And one study had even found that for every one US dollar invested in watershed protection can save upwards of $200 in 
water treatment facility. Despite these figures, the Forest Resource Assessment 2015 reports that only 25% of the world's forests have soil and water conservation as their main objective. But the forest and water topic is not new to the international agenda. In fact, FAO has been quite active for some time in a process that is referred to the forest and water agenda, a process of um, meetings and activities to promote the importance for forests and water. And this actually started with the Shiga Declaration on Forests and Water in 2002. And since then, there have been several meetings discussing forest and water topic. And most recently, uh, the latest milestone was in September of 2015, right before the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals. And this milestone was the International Forest and Water Dialogue at the World Forestry Congress in Durban, South Africa. And FAO has actually gone so far as to summarize what has come out of these meetings in the publication Forest and Water International Momentum in Action, which you can access using the link on the right. And what we found was that uh, in the period of 2002-2013, the recommendations of these meetings were rather consistent. Uh, the first major recommendation being that we need to improve our understanding of forest water interactions in the face of climate change for different scales and various forest types and that we need to be better at communicating this research to decision makers and practitioners which is something the publication that has inspired this virtual webinar has really taken leaps and bounds to do. In addition to improve understanding, we need to take a more integrative landscape approach. And referring again to the publication, we need to look beyond the traditional watershed scale, but that a landscape approach may be even looking at uh, national, regional, and continental scales. And that in order to do this, we need collaborative partnerships that cross sectors. We need capacity building at n regional, national, and local scales, the levels. We need improved monitoring systems. And that perhaps with this, we are then able to evaluate forest and water relationships as well as uh, develop intersectoral policies. While these meetings and recommendations are necessary, it's equally important that they get implemented, which is precisely why several partners including FAO, ICRAF, IUFRO, and INBAR developed and launched the five-year Forest and Water Action Plan at the World Forestry Congress in Durban in 2015. The action plan emphasizes a need to integrate science, policy, and practice, where science can be uh, implemented on the ground in real-life situations and that together these can inform adaptive policies that further encourage research and adaptive practices. Therefore, the Forest and Water Action Plan has four major goals related to science, policy, practice, and one cross-cutting goal on capacity building and communication. But what does this mean for countries? What is the current situation? There are about two dozen countries where forest and water management are housed within the same ministry. However, generally we find that these remain as silos and forest and water do not interact when it comes to policies. That does not mean that there aren't integrative policies in play or practices for that matter. Generally speaking, in the Northern Hemisphere, Canada, U.S., and Russia, we see 
forest policies and practices that take water into consideration. But this is also true in the southern hemisphere. For example, Chile last year launched their latest forest policy and there is a very strong component looking at forest management for water supply. Similarly in Kenya, uh, mountains and their ecosystems including forests are acknowledged as water towers supplying water to the rest of the country. However, when we see segregation of forests and water, this is problematic. A good example comes from the Philippines, where last year it was announced a large investment, over $120 million, was going to improve water supply infrastructure for the city. Around the same time, it was announced that the primary watershed delivering the majority of water to the city was under uh, degradation because the forest guards employed to protect the watershed had gone on strike for lack of payment and there was a sudden increase of illegal logging and slash and burn agriculture which was affecting water quality uh, from, from this watershed. So, and yet None of the 120 million being invested in water supply infrastructure was being spent on the protection of the very source of the water supply. How can that be? You're investing in improving a water supply system and yet the very source is reducing the quality of the water supply which will more quickly degrade the new infrastructure system. And this is one of the major problems with separation of forests and water, not only in policy, but in practice. Another issue in policy is that there are certain forests and water narratives that are popular and quite pervasive in policy even though they are not universally true. Four major ones are forests increase water yield, forests reduce floods, forests increase base flows, forests reduce er erosion. But the truth is that these are context specific and the converse can also be true. So long as the policy does not properly understand the context for which it's applied, we potentially see a problem. A good example, forest reduced floods really depends on scale. The scale of the area we're talking about, the, the magnitude and duration of the precipitation event prior to the flood. You can plant as many trees as you want. You're not going to prevent flooding in the floodplains of Bangladesh. And yet we often see these policies that are mismatched for the context they're in. And this is why it is important to have science inform policy and for there to be on the ground understanding of the context for which these policies apply. So from a historic and, and current uh, situation, we now move to the SDGs, which are quite new and still somewhat under development as uh, the indicators are still being worked on as we speak. And there are two SDGs where forest water relationships are explicitly acknowledged. SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation, and 15, Life on Land. There are also two other SDGs uh, for which the forest and water topic can also relate, uh, SDGs 12 and 13. Now as previously mentioned by colleagues, the climate change agenda does not uh, go beyond greenhouse gases and therefore we still need to try and 
push the forest and water topic because it is incredibly important for climate change. Um, but it is encouraging that within the INDCs, or commitments of countries to the climate change agenda, forest and water relationships are sometimes acknowledged. Special ecosystems such as mangroves and montane forests are, are explicitly mentioned for certain INDCs. So this is encouraging. But it is important to note that uh, a lot of countries mention uh, forests and water or these special ecosystems contingent on the availability of funding, meaning that they will only work on them if they receive funding from donors. On that note, I would like to look a little bit more closely at SDG 6 and 15, for which there are three relevant targets, 6.4, 6.6, and 15.1. 6.4 uh, looks at increased water use efficiency across all sectors, and the custodian agency for its indicator is FAO Aquastat. Hopefully what we will see in time is that the forestry sector becomes more water use efficient, particularly the uh, planted forest industry. Targets 6.6 .6 and 15.1 are actually very similar and plan on using similar methodology, mainly remote sensing, to measure progress. 6.6 .6 is uh, being led by UNEP in support with other agencies um, on behalf of UN Water. And 15.1, the custodian agency is FAO and will be using a forest resources assessment indicator. Both 6.6 .6 and 15.1 are looking at changes in extent area of those ecosystems. Um, and for 6.6, .6, forests are recognized as a water related ecosystem. Of course, Things haven't been reported yet, um, and what will be very interesting is to see how uh, changes in extent ecosystem then relate to water. Um, the question is, is it possible to correlate changes in land use to changes in water supply? will we be able to see that um, loss of forests or degradation of forests in a landscape does affect the extent of water that's within and coming out of these ecosystems. Hopefully this is something that we will, will see, and it will be very interesting to see how uh, the self-reporting that will be done for by countries, uh, particularly for the Forest Resources Assessment um, Indicator, how this potentially correlates to information being seen by third party uh, conducting remote sensing studies. So what does policy need in order to include forests and water? In conclusion, we need to see policy based on science. We need to see more publications like the one that sparked this webinar uh, to be produced and written in a way that it can reach practitioners and policymakers. We need to see a stronger interaction between science, policy, and practice where all three can inform each other. We also need harmonization of trade-offs and synergies. Um, within policy frameworks. We need to under, better understand what are the win-win situations and how to avoid the lose-lose. 
and include these into adaptive policies. Lastly, we need to see institutional mechanisms and opportunities for dialogue in order to address potential conflict in policies, particularly uh, policies from different sectors uh, and cross-sectoral policies. So how do we do that? We need a stock taking of international and national policies and we need to build the capacity of decision makers and stakeholders in recognizing the importance of forests and water for climate and how to uh, implement practices and policies that will help to maintain these important environmental processes that help to regulate environments and frankly life on earth. Thank you very much. Um, oh, thank, thanks a lot Elian. Very, very interesting talk that was. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try and, 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 and go back to Bogor for uh, Lei to, to introduce Vincent <coughs> and we'll come back to you Elian with questions after Vincent's talk. So please stay on and, and hopefully Victoria is also hanging on in there and waiting as well. So I would like to introduce our last speaker for today. It will be Dr. Vincent Gates, the director of CGIR research program on forestry and agroforestry. So as, as we promised before that we will connect the knowledge into actions through research. And please, uh, Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Lei, and, and, and thank you everyone. First of all, um, I feel very privileged because I'm, I'm I think from yesterday and today I'm the only one speaking, not being a co-author of this uh, paper with, uh, by, by David Ellison and colleagues, and I think uh, several colleagues from FTA have been involved, and I think it's the kind of research we, we definitely want to do in, in a program such as FTA to, to enable uh, challenging the theory or creating the conditions for, for thinking uh, outside the, the mainstream theories and, and the implication it can have. And here uh, around uh, water, uh, trees, forests, and climate change. Uh, we shouldn't minimize, at the same time there's a congratulation, I think we shouldn't minimize the challenges that will come out of this research uh, in terms of, of further, further question it asks to, to, to research, because in fact we are adding a lot of complexity, consciously, uh, to, to uh, a problem. We are adding new processes at different scales. We are, exploring new correlations, uh, uh, w therefore we're adding also new uncertainties, etc. And we need to be also very clear about that because uh, we, are, we will need to, to inform the magnitude of those processes and at the same time be clear about the uncertainties because what we want to do now is not, to, um, is not only to do more six years of research around this but to, to look at what are the key uh, implications for different areas of of, of actions and and and, and policy makings and and these are, these are the opportunities so uh, by which in fact we think that this kind of research can perhaps simplify some of the key uh, solutions that 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 we have in different ways uh, so Basically, uh, I won't go very uh, in details in terms of the uh, main findings. These are uh, were discussed during two days. What would be nice, and I think what the, the, the team of, uh, of scientists themselves have tried to do in a, in a kind of a IPCC uh, type to assess the, the degree of confidence uh, that these different findings have because they they will be very important to informing um, yes, um, the, the, the confidence we can have in, term, in terms of solutions uh, to, uh, that we can provide to, uh, to problems or, or to policy. The main thing that we can perhaps retain from this paper, this approach, the review, is that really we are in a turning point in, ter in terms of perception on how forests and trees play a role in the climate debate. 
uh, I think uh, that was said uh, from the beginning by, uh, by uh, Peter Holm, the Director General of C4, say, uh, in fact, 1992, 25 years ago, everything was about carbon, need, the need to mitigate carbon, and forests are full of carbon, and therefore forests have a big role uh, to play. Now, uh, it is, we are at a point where we need to better understand the relations between forests, trees, land uses, and climate through not only the carbon cycle, but also uh, the water cycle and other uh, bio uh, geochemical cycles. So this causes a paradigm shift that, that we that, that we are want now to, uh, to to call, whereby uh, people are looking at forests from a mitigation perspective. That's the major the majority of the literature in IPCC, for example, is about that. Then, secondly how can forests adapt to climate change and then there's a very little part of of the literature about how forests and trees can can play a role to help the world <laughs> and its people at different scales to adapt and this is the perspective that we want now to put at the forefront forests and trees will be in the new paradigm key for the adaptation at different scales the adaptation of agriculture the adaptation of livestock of crops etc and, and uh, in the face of climate change, ensuring that we reach a lot of other objectives. Uh, and this, in fact, will, we believe, will simplify the discourse or the narrative that was sometimes complicated between mitigation and adaptation, because, in fact, forest and trees will start uh, in a hot world to play a fundamental role at different scales in adaptation, and at the same time, uh, they will, they will, because uh, they store carbon. They will provide uh, mitigation as a as a as a co-benefit. So this is really the change of narrative we're calling for. It's also an inversion of perspective. I think we've seen the last two the last uh, two days from a, 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 a top-down carbon global carbon cycle perspective to by bringing water in by bringing the water cycle at different scales uh, a more bottom-up uh, perspective with also the policy implication it can have in, t in terms of local perceptions and finding for local solutions. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, as we've seen, for example, uh, even this afternoon, a good example in terms of uh, in Kenya, the Mao Forest, etc. So basically the exercise that as a bit, uh, as a way also to introduce uh, in, in, yeah, in 15 minutes the, the, the discussion we, we can collectively have on the implications uh, what um, these findings do have for implication in several domains. Uh, and, and I will briefly go through uh, six of them from climate research, climate policy, restoration, uh, landscapes, uh, uh, food security, and, 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 and the SDGs. Um, but before doing that, uh, I, want, I would like to say that all, all across uh, this domain, what this new role of forest and trees through water, through through uh, local cooling effects, uh, through through uh, to to the climate can bring, is to enable people to better understand um, what uh, are the stakes in terms of climate change uh, adaptation and what are uh, the the concrete um, actionable. Uh, options that they can they can benefit from and from from acting at, 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 at land use. So it also opens new practical avenue for bringing stakeholders, bring farmers together to understand what to do. Um, so the first domain is perhaps the most immediate one. It has been discussed already this afternoon. Uh, just to repeat what uh, uh, through the minutes in the, in, on the internet of one IPCC meeting. Uh, at COP22 uh, 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 in Marrakesh, the vice chair of uh, IPCC uh, Working Group 1, Valérie Masson, has said, because the meeting was about, oh, what are the key, uh, the key issues, uh, the urgent gaps in climate change research, it was acknowledged, many issues in the water cycle. So there is a recognition by the scientific community that the water cycle in climate is complex and that there are many things that, that the community needs to, needs to do, understand and needs to do, represent better. Uh, 
three, three among th those of three that we have discussed today, uh, reducing the uncertainty in rainfall prediction in uh, general circulation models, uh, rainfall, its variability, uh, that, that's a ver very relevant direct climate uh, variable. Uh, further research on the magnitude uh, of the effects by which forests contribute to the processes that generates rain and uh, wind and rain and the resulting rain and, and, and the challenge, scientific challenge, but also a, a community challenge to integrate, scientific community challenge to integrate these principles uh, identified in these, in these models with, with active uh, uh, vegetation feedback and while recognizing that we are here adding a set of, of several layers and processes uh, and, and related uncertainties. And as for uh, the, the, the climate uh, research, there is another point because, uh, uh, as was said by Elaine, one of the importance also to link to, to policy and IPCC is one of the elements that, that enable that. Uh, how to make these findings relevant for IPCC? And there is an upcoming uh, special report uh, of IPCC on land use and climate change. Uh, how will this report uh, go through this, uh, this, new, this new paradigm? Uh, climate policy, second, second domain. Um, here um, we are in a new phase with the Paris Agreement, with uh, the now nationally determined contribution that, that, that countries uh, have engaged to, uh, to, to fulfill. Uh, what it brings, uh, what this research is bringing, is a new uh, vision about how forests and trees can contribute to these NDCs, uh, and here what research can do and what a program as FTA can, can do is to help uh, establishing metrics and, and then how to measure them in terms of the role of forests and trees in adaptations and the benefits from the local scale to, to broader scales. And perhaps more uh, conceptually or as a framework also to understand how um, the currently segregated uh, debate in the NDCs, uh, mitiga mitigation versus adaptation can be overcome. Uh, some uh, NDCs, very interestingly, such as Mexico, have put uh, uh, the zero deforestation under adaptation, not under mitigation. So th there is already some, some, some understanding of, of, of these roles. Um, um, research, and, and one of the avenues, as Daniel Modiaso has said yesterday is to fully explore what Article 7 uh, of uh, the, the Paris Agreement can bring in, for, in terms of uh, uh, climate adaptation and how uh, the roles of forest centuries can be, can be put back in for adaptation of agriculture, of rural areas, of cities at different scales. Uh, one of the things that this uh, change of perspective will perhaps also bring is put back the mitigation focus. There is a need to mitigate. There is a need to tackle climate change because we need to have uh, to, to ensure uh, the stabilization of climate, the 1.5 degree goal, etc. This will put the mitigation focus back in the energy sector, back where it mainly belongs, and is uh, our sector, <laughs> the land use sector, from this difficult debate about, about loopholes and, 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 and contribution to, to the energy, while maintaining a full attention on what it can do for climate change adaptation. So it's not that we're going to talk less about trees, but in fact we're going to talk more about trees in climate policies. Uh, second domain, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Victoria, and uh, so is land restoration. Here as well, big pledges have been made, uh, New York, Bonn, etc. Question is, on the ground, what to plant, <laughs> where, for what objectives? Uh, and here what we can retain from this uh, research is that it provides uh, a new uh, hydroclimatic rationale over and beyond the carbon uh, or climate metrics for, to assess the performance of tree-based uh, landscape restoration. And here what we perhaps would uh, need from research would be a more systematic comparison between uh, trees and vegetation types and how their, their functional attributes 
uh, such as the one that enables uh, plants to biologically uh, create or generate rainfall, and how, how does that, per how does different types perform across uh, also in their local context, climates and, and zones. A second, uh, second question in land restoration um, beyond the plant is how, because of the teleconnections, how do we connect local action uh, and, and, and local benefits, uh, costs, local costs and local benefits with remote co-benefits uh, and, and the micro uh, beyond carbon <laughs> uh, and the, the, the starting with the microclimatic uh, effects. So, uh, what, what can we give to stakeholders discussing these uh, um, restoration plans to understand these effects and how can we test that perhaps at a sub-national scale uh, to, to discuss the repartition of costs, uh, of costs and, and, and benefits and the acceptance to stakeholders because sometimes perhaps maintaining a forest upwind will be critically important to maintain the uh, the crop basket, the, the uh, downwind, and we need to bring that in the picture in terms of, of restoration. Next, next domain, uh, landscape. Yeah, yes, yeah. speak a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, landscape policies. Um, of course, this is not only about restoration; it cuts across how to organize land uses at different scales for water and climate. Uh, and here, what we think. Uh, the research we've shown can, can, can bring is effective and, and some tailored tools to understand uh, the location specific uh, nature of atmospheric moisture, uh, rainfall, the sources, etc., and perhaps uh, maps or, or cover transfer functions that will uh, include uh, land cover or tree cover to better understand the, the microclimate predictions uh, 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 and, and, and possibilities at landscape levels. V visualization tool uh, also for, for cooling at, uh, from the rural to urban uh, continuum. Basically, by in doing so, we can, not only, we can not only inform the land policy, but we believe we can also inform the water policies. Not will be complicated because water management is complex. If we know we, we try to manage also atmospheric moisture, is going to be even more complex. But that's that definitely now in the in the picture. Food and food security policies, uh, another area for, for for action. And here the question is: What is what are the various roles of forest and trees from? the continental scale to the farm scales in terms of preserving uh, food security. Uh, first of all, food, food, the variability of food production is heavily dependent on rainfall. And here, all this research is in fact questioning how, what's the origin of rain, rainfall and what the role of forest. We, we need to have a better understanding of, of the different scales of variation of rainfall and their origin, and to contextualize that variability in support of what the rest of agricultural research is doing in terms of, of climate smart uh, uh, options. Uh, second, um, because there are teleconnections, as we saw, uh, research can undertake to document and quantify the role of forests to generate rain in, in very important areas where uh, that, that produced, the, to, to summarize the food security, uh, the food security in the world. And Lastly, at the more local uh, farm or even plot scales, uh, it might be opening already open door, but to recall that when we're in a hot world, uh, basically for a farmer to adapt to climate change, he can try or she to change its crops or rely on a definite innovation uh, uh, to, to change uh, the, the, the variety, etc. But uh, one other option that can be provided is to modify or to enable uh, the systems to better cope with heat, to better cope with a hot temperature that can, in two or three days, destroy the crop. And many of these options, let's recall, that, let's, let's recall that very clearly, depend on how farm systems integrate trees or, or, or different crop systems integrate trees within or at the border uh, or at the farm scale. Uh, finally, uh, uh, last, last speaker, Elaine, has mentioned this, the Sustainable Development Goals. 17 SDGs, <laughs> uh, one on forest, 16 others. It's very complex. 
there are, by definition, many connections, how to navigate through that and how to give to stakeholders simple solutions that are easy to grasp when everything seems so complex and we're even adding more complexity because we're adding new, new processes. This is also where we believe by focusing on these new roles of trees and forests through water, we can find simple solutions that will kill not only one bird or two birds in one stone, but several ones, food security, water security, climate change mitigation. As, a, as, a, as an illustration of this, I'm, I'm uh, uh, here um, displaying again the uh, figure three of, of, of the paper. Uh, which is also challenging one of the common uh, understanding between groundwater rechar re recharge and, and canopy cover. Here, the landscape in the middle is better for water, is pro probably better for, for food production, is probably better for biodiversity, and is probably also better for, for, for wood and for livelihoods for other purposes. So we are, in fact, provi providing some solution that fit uh, uh, several challenges. Now, this, uh, all these implications uh, are for uh, research, for the roles of research, what that research can do in, 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 in action and in policy making. Of course, that also interpels the role of, of uh, the CGI program on forest trees and agroforestry, which is the, uh, the biggest science and, and research in development uh, partnership to, to address the role that forest trees and, and landscape can play for climate change, for sustainable development, uh, and for food security. And um, I've just tried to summarize, because some of the, uh, you are in the room, uh, or in, in uh, Nairobi, uh, perhaps in Lima, uh, that uh, all of this is also um, going to draw um, some implication for how we run our program. First, we're going to invest more in forest climate change field beyond carbon. Uh, we have a flagship about climate change. That's going to be a focus. Uh, second, we are going to work at the forest water cycle interface. There are other programs of the CGR that look at that, uh, the, the, the climate change, uh, uh, agriculture, and food security program, the program on land, water, and ecosystems. Uh, we are going to harness uh, the one of uh, the key uh, advantage of, of FTA is to be able to ground its, uh, its science and knowledge on the set of sentinel landscape where uh, systematic uh, data uh, is uh, studied on, on several dimensions from livelihood to the environment. And here, a, a set of seven sentinel landscape, two landscapes are very important for um, some of the the processes we've been studying now, today and yesterday, water towers landscape uh, across uh, Kenya and Uganda and uh, the Ghats uh, uh, in, in, in India. And, and what does it mean in terms of uh, the teleconnection effects? What does it mean uh, in, in terms of, of food security? We're going to look at that. Uh, lastly, the five uh, last red uh, circles is to say that uh, we we're going to, we need, with this inversion of perspective, we need even more to pay attention to location and context. Uh, this is the, the, what, what um, Miner's uh, fa uh, favorite theory of, of, of place. Uh, we really need to think about that and look at the, the various typology that we will encounter between water and forests, uh, depending on the local situation and also the, the needs of the populations. Uh, in doing so, we need to be sure we are not oversimplifying. Uh, of course, our message at C4, at ECRAF, uh, is that trees are very good, and they're cool, and they're good for, for plenty of reasons, but, but it's sometimes not always the same reason, and sometimes not the, the same everywhere. We need to be clear about that. We don't need to, and to finish, yes, because my time is over. Um, one of the important because we want to be credible at the same time and influence policy making and action, we also need to be sure on how we're going to assess the magnitude and the uncertainties of the, of the claims we, we, we've been doing. We know it's, it's, it's difficult, but, but we, we, need, we need to do that. And finally, uh, to conclude, one of the, um, because we have discussed that in the management teams of, uh, of, of, of FTA with all the partners, 
in the CG, but also the, the centers outside the CGs. I will not mention them, <laughs> there, are, there are several of them, but well, Cartier, Sirat, uh, uh, Inba, and Tropenbos, that uh, we uh, need to ensure in a research program that for development, that perhaps 70% of the research we're going to do is going to provide solution on, on things we, we know very well and we're going to scale up, etc. But we need to to safeguard as part of the research program, even an applied research program for a, a bit of research and a bit of time and a bit of efforts on, on, on this kind of research that is challenging the theory, but at the same time, perhaps offering sustainable solutions for, for five years or 10 years uh, later. And this is what we're going to do also in our program during 2017, 2022. Thank yes, you. thank you, Vincent. <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting that you highlight about these five um, do action domain range from uh, climate policy, land restorations, landscape, food security, and finally SDG. And your last PowerPoint presentations also reminds me as uh, my own evaluation tools as one of the FDA scientists. Let me just go over to <laughs> Peter. Hi, Lei Tang. It was very, very interesting from Vincent. At the moment, no questions yet from the floor. We'll, 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 we'll hold on for a bit to see what's coming through. Oh, yeah, we have a question here, Why actually, Yang? Peter. So there is a, yeah. a question from Twitter. So we have chat room, we have Twitter. It's from Fesela with hashtag trees are cool uh, at forests for future. So, so maybe Victoria and Elaine, uh, or even Vincent, you can comment about how, has anyone researched into the real value of the forest for desert countries? <laughs> so anybody wants to pick up these challenging questions? Victoria or Elaine? What is the question? Please? Sorry, could you repeat the question? It was a little hard to hear. Has anyone doing a research or researches into the real value of forests for mm -hmm. countries with desert. 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 Not desert. Desert. <laughs> um, I guess it, it would depend on if we're talking about um, actual deserts or we're talking about drylands and say restoration uh, and dryland forests. Um, in which case, yes, there is research being done, um, primarily in the Mediterranean area. Um, but the truth is, I, as I think even Tony mentioned earlier um, in his uh, quick intervention, that water isn't necessarily included in the value of forests. Um, so, for example, there was interesting research even by uh, some of our, the co-authors of the paper that looked at um, canopy cover and groundwater recharge. And I think maybe uh, Douglas might be able to add more to that. But um, I, I don't think this is necessarily, or the forest water relationships aren't necessarily evaluated and, and included. So while the research is there um, or is being developed, it's not necessarily being incorporated into practice or policy at this time. Victoria, do yes, you want? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to add that uh, we we did. Um, I think some of the, the presenters yesterday referred to drylands and um, in in uh, in West Africa uh, research by uh, Core authors in the paper. Um, and as Elaine mentions, it, it, uh, it looked at infiltration capacity uh, in relation to um, tree cover and, and tree density. Um, so there is there, there clearly is some research. Um, I, I think what would be also interesting is to connect with the drylands uh, group uh, that are very much focused on, on um, the, the Great Green Wall um, all the way from East to um, to the west coast, um, so so I think that there is quite a bit of activity in that um, in, in this in this area. Okay, thank you, Victoria. 
Well, uh, maybe, maybe to add a bit on that concept of value, of course, there's a whole, yeah, the whole separate science on ecosystem services and their valuations and uh, an active group of, of meetings and discussions that many of which are facilitated as part of. At the same time, um, with the perspective of what we've been sharing these two days, uh, we need to be fairly critical of many of the ways these valuations have been done so far. Um, they, they definitely have problems with scale. They tend to look at one thing at a time, try to get some economic value. But I think it is still very far from the, the current ecological understanding that we have been sharing these two days. So I think that field of valuation is, is still, um, yeah, we need to further discuss the insights that we have right here now um, need to be translated to the people who work within that valuation concept. And there's many challenges on the right scale of doing it. Of course, forest in the desert is a bit of a conundrum. Um, it's partly then a matter of definitions. What is a forest, what not? The very few trees that you still see in the desert per unit biomass will be awfully important. Um, but it would not be classified as a forest by most existing standards. Yes, thank you, Pamela. Yeah, I would like to add more, but from my role as facilitator, I have to, <laughs> to stop. Uh, let me just uh, go to Elaine. Um, there is a, there, we have students here from IPB, the Bogor Agricultural University, and we have Ahmad Solihin. So he wants, you, uh, he wants you to answer his questions on what will be the next agenda of a FAO on forest and water. Uh, and particularly for the next uh, eighth um, World Water Forum in Brazil. And what will be uh, how to ensure the SDG number six and SDG number 15 to be integrated and sustained? Please, Elaine. Well, FAO is currently trying to develop a standardized monitoring framework in order to better understand forest water relationships on the ground. There are thousands of forestry projects um, and activities happening worldwide every year. And quite frankly, a lot of them don't um, necessarily look at forest water relationships at all. So trying to develop indicators to encourage uh, looking at forest water relationships and how uh, so this is something that we'll be working on for the next little while. And the reason why we're doing this is because, as um, I mentioned during my presentation, the lack of monitoring, the lack of data, the lack of understanding forest and water relationships for different contexts is, uh, is missing. Um, so this is why we're focusing on this. As for ensuring SDGs 6 and 15 are sustained, I mean, this is, uh, FAO is, is working on this front from, from many directions, not only from the Forest and Water Program. Uh, we're supporting countries, but this is definitely a, a long-term process and requires a lot more effort beyond just FAO. Um, and I think it's up to the different stakeholders, uh, civil society, other international organizations to really ensure that countries uh, remain on, on track um, and we will probably have to look at how to build the capacities of countries to, to deliver results um, and of course it's a little premature at this stage to comment too much because the indicators, um, those organizations, uh, custodian agencies that are in charge of helping to report on these indicators, it's, it's still a developing process. Um, so I think it will be easier to comment once we see the first numbers or the first reporting um, and then see what needs to be done from there. Hopefully that answers the two questions. Yes, thank you, Elaine. Peter, uh, okay. you have a question, please. Yeah, um, thanks, Elian, and um, thanks, Leigh. Um, there is a quest There is another question from uh, still from Ahmed Solikhin, Ahmad Solikhin, who, who is asking, um, I think, to all the presenters, uh, how do we implement uh, climate, forest, 
water and energy within a coherent policy framework um, without buzzwords that will necessarily create confusion and, and conflict. I think the simple answer is with great difficulty. <laughs> um, in, in my experience, I think you have, as I mentioned, forest, water, even energy policies. They're often housed within different ministries. And even if they are within the same ministries, different departments, there's a lot of segregation. And quite frankly, there's also a lot of conflict. You have incentives for policies, even agriculture policies, that directly conflict with policies of other sectors. And I think until we can develop mechanisms for countries to deal with these conflicts, um, it will be quite challenging to have truly integrative policies. But I would love to hear from the other speakers what their point of views are. Oh, um, thanks, Eliane. Victoria, Vincent, any thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, OK, because I, I was thinking about this um, when uh, you know, the, the questions that were coming up yesterday. and. Um, you know, I think it is true that there, that there will be uh, quite, a, quite many conflicts arising from uh, the various agendas of, of a whole range of stakeholders. But I think there's also um, there are opportunities there if we um, are quite open to to, to think about uh, engaging multi multi sectors um, and, and, and multiple stakeholders. Um, so I, I was referring to a, a specific approach to forest landscape restoration because I think it sort of um, uh, has uh, or works with uh, a lot of the, the key components that are necessary to, to effectively bring together a, a whole range of agendas and, and deliver on a number of objectives. So, so in some ways, uh, there, there may be a, a range of opportunities that are already uh, available that can be uh, brought in um, and used as entry points to discuss issues that are that are quite delicate. Um, also, I was, I was thinking about um, uh, one of the ways in which we can uh, also help improve our communication in, in terms of um, taking the, the knowledge, scientific knowledge base, uh, to um, policy and, and decision makers. I think. Um, Bringing um, the different stakeholders in quite early is, 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 a, is an approach that might um, make sense. Um, in some ways, uh, thinking back at how we um, uh, developed the, the policy brief and what we've done with it, uh, we've basically distributed a, a message. Um, but I, I think if we had to, had to do it again, probably uh, an idea would be to engage policymakers at some stage to, to better understand what kind of information, what kind of data is required uh, for them to make certain decisions. And, and I think that applies to the, the whole range of scales of decision making uh, with water, energy, climate, etc. Um, so, so perhaps one of, one of the approaches would be to um, continue with, with research that is, is applied and, and one that includes um, stakeholders that uh, will be um, making decisions uh, later on with with results, and um, if, if that were the case, and if we were to make this uh, work, I think then um, one of the advantages would be that you already increased uh, the likelihood of uptaking uh, of of taking on board th these results. So it's 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 very much um, I think thinking or rethinking the relationship we have. Um, between science practitioners and, and policy makers to, to make sure that uh, this agenda comes forth. So. Oh, well, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Victoria. I, I don't see Vincent yes, ready to yes. talk. Yes, no, Vincent. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we'll, we'll try and. No, thanks. Yes, Peter, uh, thank Vincent. you, Peter. No, just thank okay. you, Victoria, because you you made my, my answer easier. Because in fact, I was trying to wanting to yeah. say exactly the same thing, and in in, in top of that, uh, thing that we in FTA and and, and and with the Global Landscapes Forum and and, and, and also we see for what we want to to exactly uh, uh, provide is is a tool to start from the from the ground up 
in organizing these difficult debates. And what you mentioned, two important things. Uh, integrate the dimensions, integrate the stakeholders, and inform the dialogue by, by knowledge that is generated at the same time by the stakeholders uh, given the local context. And, and the understanding starts with clearly sharing the problems <laughs> before sharing the solutions. So this is also at landscape level, the, the problems of energy, water, uh, the food security, uh, they are different and, and, and what are the, the priorities, what a landscape can, with the people in it can deliver is the first, if it's the first thing you need to, you need to agree. And this is, uh, and then of course, uh, decide, uh, deciding on the solution based on on the, on the knowledge that that's available, and that's what we are trying to do at global scale with the Global Landscapes Forum, and also at at local uh, scales. For example, uh, the 18th of May, that's what we're going to do uh, here in Jakarta with uh, with UNEP and then the Global Landscapes Forum on on peatlands, uh, for for instance. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Vincent. Um, we'll now go come to the room here in, at ECRAF in, in Nairobi. And Andrew, please, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, first and foremost, my apologies for coming in so late in the day during these two days. Um, but I had a comment, really, for David Miner, uh, Doug, uh, Daniel, and, and Bruno, who I already had an exchange with. One of the things that struck me about this paper that was recently published was the extent to which it was ahistorical. And I think I would like, on the basis of what uh, uh, Vincent presented, to, to perhaps add a sixth question uh, to the five he already raised. And that is, I think, the importance that we actually take a much more rigorous effort to actually look at the historical evidence of institutional and conservationist responses to the fears of artificially induced climate change. And this spans more than 450 years and is documented. So I think there are question marks about the novelty of this relationship between forest and water, which in fact goes back, goes back originally to the Greeks. And many of the Arabic texts which conserved the ideas uh, and then triggered the growth and in the interest in European centers of science, in, particularly in France and Britain, already from the 16th and 17th centuries. And then this culminated throughout the expansion of European powers globally and underpinned much of the interventions in terms of forest science. So I'd, I mean, I'd like to add to what Vincent raised when he raised point number two of avoiding oversimplification and that trees are good for everything. But I would add to that, I think some scholars, notably Diana Davis, have raised concerns about the forest-centric mood that has gripped the Anglo-European imagination since the 19th century, particularly in terms of the policy responses in dryland forests. And I raise this because Victoria again brought up, or mentioned recent, uh, very briefly uh, in her, one of her early exposes, the Great Green Wall Project. This is little more than a repetition of a policy response that was initiated after the Anglo-French Forestry Commission was conducted in 1936. And I think there's lots that we could learn from some of those historical precedents to avoid us repeating the same mistakes that were made 80, 90 years ago. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot, uh, um, <coughs> Andrew, for, for that. We'll try and get a quick response from Miner and, and then Sang from Bogor, and then we'll come back to, to Tony for, for his closing remarks. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Andrew. This is a topic that we have discussed many times, and, and, and I really enjoy it. Um, clearly, within the Indonesian context, for example, we, this debate on forest and water was, became very hot in the 1920s, and we've had various ways to look back at that and, and see at that point in time. Um, and it seems that the existing target of 30% forest in Indonesian law is based on snow melt patterns in Switzerland, um, which doesn't seem to be and its relation with floods. So yeah, there is a lot of interesting things to say about that. And, and I think one of the 
the key ideas of these sentinel landscapes is that we, we ground our work in the historical understanding of those places and, and feed that into that part so that we don't have a quick study here and there, um, but we actually ground it in that rooted part. So I, I fully agree with you, this is important. Um, and, and I think we're trying to do it um, in the current work, but, but we need people like you to help us connect with that further. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mayan. I hope um, you will continue the discussion within FTA and with partners on, on this. Um, um, uh, Elaine, uh, Victoria, um, uh, Jan, thank you very much. I think it's been great. Unfortunately, we can't keep going because of time, but the talks were great, and, and I can see everyone really happy. So thank you once again. I think we'll in now invite uh, Professor Tony Simons, the Director General of ECRAF, World Agroforestry Center, to offer his closing remarks. Thanks very much, Peter, and th thanks very much to our colleagues in Bogor, um, both the organizers and our, our remote speakers in Australia and Norway and Italy and Czechoslovakia and other countries in the world. A fascinating two-day symposium, really, on the linkages between forest and water, and much of it framed in the climate debate. And we've struggled for, for decades of of trying to say, well, let's make the forest be worth more than its carbon. And I think what has been presented over the last few days gives us a lot of um, hope that maybe it's going to, water is going to be one of those key elements that, that reinforces the, the real value of, of forests. Um, if you ask for one point in summary about these two days, um, I think it would be that there's been some very clouded thinking. And to the presenters, um, please take that as a compliment. Um, because this, this ability of, of vegetation, particularly perennial vegetation trees, to, um, to pump water, both from, from hydraulic lift and also uh, the biotic pump that, that Doug spoke about, is, is really fascinating. I've, I've learned a lot in the last two days listening to these and, and checking various facts in, in Google about it. I think another staggering point that came across is, is just how many missing elements there are in our various climatic models in relation to water, in relation to, to temperature, in relation to the presence and role of trees. And, and yet we take those models as, as granted and, and why aren't politicians listening to them? And our role as scientists is to continue to build the evidence, continue to test the theory, continue to, to push to find explanations that, that change human uh, challenges and problems. And I think these uh, couple of days have been fantastic and I, I applaud the, the organizers really for, for helping frame it and, and, and distill it very much for us. Um, a little bit was mentioned about, about the difference between the price, the cost and the value of water. Um, and how much water you pay per cubic meter in your country if it's through a municipal tap versus how much it's worth if it's blue water in your river or your irrigation canal or if you're collecting it off a rainwater harvesting roof or if it's your vegetation that is helping collect it in the soil and, and recycle it for us. Um, for a number of years there were big debates about where the water on the world came from. And there's kind of two theories. One is well, it must have come from inside the earth. When the, after the earth was formed, that's where it came from. Or it must be a whole lot of bunch of comets and asteroids that arrived with little payloads of ice on them and dropped it off on the surface as they collided with us. Um, and the jury is still out on that, but there is more of a favor that it came from inside the earth. And it's not, luckily for us, that it's not leaking to the atmosphere because clouds are just such a low... Um, uh, altitude that we don't, don't lose it because we have this fantastic gravity. But we're losing, it seems, 
not losing the water, but we're losing the functionality of it. And we're losing the functionality of it because we're losing the forest. And driving those functions, and not just the ecological functions, and, and you know, perhaps it's a shame that we didn't have more on the, on the, the human, the livelihood implications of a lot of the work uh, that was discussed here, here today. So perhaps that's the challenge for the next um, iteration of the seminar on, on how it affects um, people's livelihoods. And people's access, availability, their rights um, to use water. Because we know a lot about those very linear watershed relationships where, where downstream users uh, um, get put out. But these teleconnections show that you know, there is that role for, for international understanding and policy making. You know, Gabon has 87% forest cover. Does American Samoa has 95% forest cover. Do they need that level of forest cover for their societies? No. But the world needs it. The world needs it as a carbon sink, and the world needs it as, a, as these biotic pumps and drivers of, of beneficial precipitation. So if the world needs it, the world has to pay for it. The world has to provide for it. The world has to be accountable for it. And, and that strengthens the idea that maybe you know, carbon has tried fighting on its own to uh, help protect forests and it hasn't worked with forests and carbon and the, the human and ecolo other ecological dimensions. Maybe it's not just about payment for services, but it's real, real valuation of understanding, understanding those. Whether people decide to, to accept those values um, is neither here nor there. I mean, obviously, a lot of the work of C4 and FTA partners and ICRAF is around um, tropical forests and, and, and in many places, rainforests. And it's kind of, you know, that <laughs> should be a little bit of a clue in the title there, a rainforest. Yeah? So it's a forest that, that generates rain and it's a forest that uh, receives a lot of rain. And what we've seen from a lot of the presentations today is that there is a link. Anyone in, uh, in Bogor or, or Nairobi got the best definition for us of what is a rainforest? We're all experts. It's our field. We should know about it. It's the topic of the seminar. So go to Google and, and, and find out your own nice favorite definition of what a rainforest is and whether that's the minimum number of months that doesn't receive 100 millimeters of rainfall or the, the lowest threshold being two and a half meters of rainfall a year come up with it because we need to be able to champion rainforests and that's every single tree, not just those that occur in our classic rainforests. So um, just with those few closing remarks, again, like to, to thank you. This, although it's only been six hours of presentations, it's been tremendous um, effort by the planners, the conveners, the moderators, the presenters, and, and others. And uh, I look forward to discussing with our staff in ICRAF and, and also with our FTA partners on how we take this forward and mainstream and challenge ourselves more in our own individual project uh, agendas and the centre agendas and in these, these CGR research programmes. Thanks very much for being part of what has truly been a fantastic event and can we show our deepest, deepest appreciation to the organisers, the speakers and conveners behind us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. We fully agree with your all points. So it's time for us to close this symposium, but there will be in, uh, some announcement. But before the announcement, let us give a big hand to all our speakers. And for sure, we will. Uh, we also thank for C4 and Ecraft for becoming the host of this. Maybe almost the first in Indonesia, pa? the virtual symposium, and also for the hard work of the team here. We have an IT team. Can you give the camera camera to our IT team? They have been working very hard preparing all of this, and also to. Um, our not take, uh, taking a team and everybody here. Uh, before I close, uh, we will have two announcements. The first one, 
Our communication team mentioned that uh, the recorded presentation and the question and answer sessions will be available in the FTA website about a week from now. So it means uh, at the end of uh, March and in beginning of April, it should be ready for you to download. And also if you want to know more and get clarifications, the speakers also mentioned that they are happy to receive more questions through emails, right? And the second one, so we have uh, students here participating and uh, we also want to appreciate the students uh, from Bogor Agricultural University uh, for sure that uh, having young generations in the room is always promising to hand over all of the findings uh, that we have now. Okay, uh, that's all from me and it will be uh, our pleasure to be interact with you all uh, after this symposium ends. Thank you. Bye.